My name is Jeff Dyer, and I'm here to convert you from the sins of lateness to the virtues of punctuality. Now, I don't want to engage in negative campaigning, because I don't need to. There's no need to dwell on the horror of lateness. You don't need me to tell you that if you arrive early for an appointment, you're wasting your own time, and if you arrive late, you're wasting someone else's. I don't need to say that one man's lateness is another man's waiting. And of course, I don't need to tell you that there are few things in the world worse than waiting. The thing is, though, punctuality itself often has negative, or at least austere, life-denying connotations. The characteristic formation of the punctual person is sounded by the music conductor, I can't remember his name, who said that I had a strict evangelical Protestant education. I grew up with the fear of God and the love of punctuality, precision, hard labour and bad food. Now, in contrast to this unswerving rectitude, it's not surprising that we tend to associate unpunctuality with fun, leisure and, I suppose, by implication, good food. Milton famously gave the devil all the best lines. And I'm struck by how often bad qualities have a good, or at the very least, an attractive reputation. Now, my parents were very reliable people. Reliability and dependability were the qualities by which they set the greatest store. So, naturally enough, when I left home, I was briefly infatuated by carefree people who had a more extravagant relation to the world. But of course, by carefree, what we mean is without care, careless, or in a word, careless. But it seems to me that actually people who are late are also the key losers, the ones without cash who've forgotten their passports or mislaid their concert tickets. Have naught to do with them. Because they're not fun, wild, crazy people, they're bores. Or, and this is the really terrible thing, they force you to become boring, to clear up the mess which they leave in their wake, but which you can see coming like an awful bow wave. There's just not enough time for late people. Speaking of time, allow me to tell you about my own timepieces. Except the first thing to say is I don't wear a watch, because I don't need one. Because I am, in a sense, a human watch. I am Kronos, time incarnate. Actually, I exaggerate. One of the reasons I don't wear a watch is because I love getting little glimpses of time on parking meters or on clocks seen through windows. And what could be nicer than hearing church bells as one walks down King William Street to where St Mary Woolnoth keeps the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. Uh, that's from the wasteland, of course, T.S. Eliot. Not somebody you can easily imagine being late. So, I don't have a watch, but I do have this. Which was a wedding present from my friend Joe Morrison. Now, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's easy to read, and the great thing is it adjusts itself in accordance with the BBC radio waves. Uh, obviously, time is not consensual or democratically established. This, my little travel clock, takes its cue from this, my radio-controlled clock, which is answerable to the BBC, which in turn takes its time, I'm guessing, from Big Ben in the great chain of temporal command. And I can't tell you how happy it makes me when I have the radio on at home and the beep starts sounding the time and I look at my clock, which, if it's just a couple of seconds out, leaps forward at precisely the moment of that last defining beep. When my friend gave me this clock, he said it was a clock for 
people who loved time. And I hadn't realized until that moment that, yeah, I was somebody who, who loved time. It was something I had in common with Roland Barthes, actually, who, in Camera Lucida, says, For me, the noise of time is not sad. I love bells, clocks, watches. And the first cameras, he reminds us, were, in a sense, clocks for seeing. I guess it's becoming evident now that while this sermon is notionally about punctuality, really it's about time. It's about time. It's on time. Being and time. Sein und Zeit. At the Olympics we love the 100 metres sprint because in that race time is of the essence. We know that split seconds count. In the sprint, there's no such thing as a dead heat. Time is microscopically magnified and stretched. What we witness, I think, as the hush begins to fill the stadium before the race begins, is the interval between normal time being suspended and a specially intensified time being unleashed. In a way, the 100 metres is not about who can run the fastest, it's about who can get to the finishing line in time. Well, to come second, third, fourth or eighth is, of course, to be late. If only life were calibrated as finely as it is during those ten seconds, I, for one, would be a far happier bunny. Now, as you'll have guessed, we've reached that part of the sermon where a metaphor that's been gradually emerging or that's been explicitly stated sets up the big moral point. And the point, of course, brothers and sisters, is that life is like that race. On sleepless nights, Adorno claims that we could feel, and I quote, the mockery of light years for the brief span of our existence. And you'll all have noticed, I think, the way that Although the afternoons might seem interminable, the weeks and months just fly by. So although at times life feels like a marathon, although sometimes you feel so weary you can hardly face taking another step, the truth is that life is a sprint. We give birth, as Beckett said, astride the grave. And to put it as simply as possible, we just haven't got the time to be late.